Hi, I'm Kyle, and I am so unbelievably excited about the video that you're about to see, Conscious Relationships. Now, this is funny because anyone that knows me would go, Kyle, I don't know that you should be doing a video on relationships. It's not an area you excel in. It's definitely an area that I've struggled in in my life. And what happened was my friend Rachel Birch has a podcast called Love Before 100, and she asked me if I would do an interview on her podcast, and I said yes. And what's so surreal to me is that the answers that came through from me were definitely from some higher self. And it was almost like the higher self gave every single answer to every question the Kyle who struggles in relationships would ask. I'm really excited about this because relationships have been something that are in a different dimension than we're heading towards. In other words, there's a lot of relationships that are based on control and ownership and you can't and all these different things. And this interview helped me look at, if you're doing the inner work, how to move forward and make relationships expansive, love-based, not attachment-based, how to release fear, and so many other things. I promise you, if you watch this interview, it will help you profoundly in your relationship areas. And also, if you're single, it'll help you move forward to a connection to yourself that's so much bigger in order to make space for something so much more awesome. Enjoy this interview. It'll change your life. I promise. Hi, Kyle. How are you? I am so good, Rachel. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm so excited to spend time with you today. Me too. So, um, yeah, I mostly am really looking for your guidance and expertise in this area that we've talked about many times, but I'm still working on deepening into this concept of not getting attached, not okay. attaching to an outcome and specifically not attaching to a person. So one thing already that just shows up for me to say is the good news is you're already not attached to anything. We have a lot of conditioning that made things sticky based on the level of awareness we're at. But it's funny because how are we attached to something that we are? I mean, everything within this reality is you. And when we're fighting to keep a small story alive, we then cling to someone in order to not have to feel the trauma that's under that story, right? Like in order to not feel alone, I'm going to get a partner, right? But that's not a good reason to because the, the fear of feeling alone is still there. It's just covered up. So now a person becomes an addiction and that's how attachment works, right? Yeah. But then you have a society that's completely normalized that as the truth and made it a fact that attachment is love and that's not, you know, every love song, every, every movie that has a love story, whatever has created this idea that really what is attachment is what we call love. And so we're going insane because we're, we're saying, I love that person so much. Look how much it hurts that they're not here. And the real core of the problem is the meaning and the words you're putting on top of it. If you just started saying, oh, I'm experiencing attachment to this person, we, we see it's much easier to break off of than if we're putting the word love over it, which makes it all complicated and not true. And so we're, we're unable to release them because we believe that there's some lie that they complete us or something. And we're here to really release those lies to get to the true essence of what we are. And then you'll realize the person you thought you were attached to, you're actually, even if you never see them again, closer to them because they are you, right? So the yeah. stuckness is just the small self trying to stay alive and, and you're all that is. So there's no, there's no real truth to attachment other than conditioning, right? Yeah. Does that make no, sense? It totally makes sense. The other day I was um, walking and I was thinking, I was like, what if the biggest conspiracy theory of them all is that we will find love outside of ourselves? Because, sure. you know, like, what if that's the biggest conspiracy? I mean, because I think back to the songs and the movies right. and like really being conditioned to believe that. And I was like, this seems like a conspiracy theory to me. Well, I know I spoke about this at an event that you were at recently, but it's really funny if you think about really let's get literal with love song lyrics, right? Yeah. Like there's a song that I always go to as a very funny example. It's a very famous song that many people know. It's called I Only Have Eyes For You. Okay. 
At one point, he says, are the stars out tonight? I don't know if it's cloudy or bright. Okay. Because he's staring at her, like, horrifyingly, right? And then at one point, he says, I don't know if we're in a garden or a crowded avenue. Now, I just want to just take a second and picture being this poor woman that now needs to get him out of traffic because he can't (laughs) tell where he is. And he's just like this. I don't know if we're in a garden. And she's like, okay, there's cars coming. And, and I, cause I only have, a, I only see you really. That is a lot of pressure on this woman (laughs) and really picture. Like I, you just know, like if I tell him I'm going to go out with my girlfriends tonight, he's going to go insane. He doesn't even know if we're in a garden. So, you know, when you really break down the lyrics, like there's a Chicago song, just say you'll love me for the rest of my life. What? That's my (laughs) job to hop on your bizarre controlling timeline because you can't go on if you're on your own. He even says, because I can't go on if I'm on my own. And people heard that for 40 years and are like, that is so beautiful. No, that is horrifying. He's threatening suicide to you if you don't stay and declare a lifetime contract of being with him forever. So these songs are incredibly horrifyingly codependent, um, psychopathic, uh, narcissistic, uh, controlling. This is just verbal dungeon stuff. Like, you know. I mean, you can't show up and be that way on a date. These days, you can't show up and be that way on a date. Right. Imagine telling your friends, like, I had a date with a guy who doesn't know if we were in the garden or on the freeway. He couldn't tell because he was so obsessed with me. So into me. Right. So and isn't that your hard? friends in real life wouldn't go, oh, my God, he sounds like a dream. Yeah. Keep They'd her. be like, that's that's insane, dangerous stalker stuff. Like, there's movies like fatal attraction about that guy, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, um, I did an episode last season, um, about a one night stand and I, that song, um, all I want to do is make love to you. And she, she sleeps with a guy and leaves. And then she leaves a note that says, you know, like we walked in the garden, we planted a tree. Don't try to find me. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think he was actually going to come looking for you, especially after that note, you know, like, yeah, you're a weirdo. Don't worry. He's letting you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Ann Wilson of Heart, I saw an interview with her like a month ago or so, maybe even less than that, saying, I don't remember the whole thing, but something about she doesn't like that song. She thinks it's a very stalkery, not good <laughs> song. It's yeah. not a good way to treat someone. <laughs> Exactly. So yeah, Yeah. it's horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sadly for me being raised on these songs and these movies, there is, I mean, I'm not going to go so far as to say I'm like a horrifying stalker, but close, like close sometimes, you know? And so through the work that I've done with you over the last couple of years and listening to you and kind of following along, I've worked through a lot of these, like, I don't, you know, like desire to be seen, desire to be special, like all these wounds and old stories um, that were just in there that, you know, I wasn't conscious of. Um, And there's, you know, this always evolving kind of next level. And I really am in this season of the podcast looking at in life, of course, it's not just about that, but like, how do I deepen into, um, just self-sufficiency in the sense of like not needing to attach. I did notice the other day, oh, I didn't hear from this guy. And now there's a lack of a, um, like a dopamine boost. And so now I have to sit in the discomfort of what's happening in my everyday life. I don't, I don't want to do that, you know? Well, one thing that's so great is the language you're using to, to like kind of honor and see patterns. Like you're not at the level where you're, just saying, why didn't he call me and mad at him? Right. right? You're, which also you have a right to feel those things too, but like you're talking from your awareness of a pattern that exists and saying words like just sitting in it for a while, you know, that's a way that it starts to go. Um, you know, like the pattern, for instance, of feeling special, like you were just talking about, uh, I want to feel special. The implication is you're not, 
already. Like in wanting to feel special, we're already creating an implication that we're not, right? I want to have a connection with someone already implies a lie that you're not. And it's weird how much our desire for something is actually numbing the truth of things. Like your specialness is not just based on a guy choosing to commit to you. It's such a, that, that makes that guy's choice your God more than God. Right. And so to be like, okay, I'm special to this guy. Um, and my specialness is just based on that. He's choosing out of his whole egoic life and everything to be just committed to me sexually or intri- like those kind of things are, uh, I'm not saying, I hope everyone hears this right. And I'm not saying don't have a committed relationship if it calls to you. I'm just really interested in, in the fascinating lies that we're stuck in of the idea that you need to become special and that that's through an external means of, of another person. The idea that um, you need to be seen, which buries the seen energy from you. It literally only wants to be seen by you. Now, what we've created through our conditioning is the idea that when someone else outside of me sees me, then I'm seen. And really what's happening is when someone outside you sees you, you then see what they're seeing and see yourself. And so you finally feel fine because you feel seen directly, but that's just because you believe you need the middleman of the outside. And and what really we're working on now is moving to a dimension where your seen is not through other people. There's a reason why the same person that can fall in love so deeply can later get in trouble for a chaotic fight with that person or domestic violence charges or different things because this person was the answer to my life. And so all pressure and all unconscious God energy was on this person, not the self. And then they cha- they didn't match all the expectations that I created when I fell in love. So now I'm violently angry at them or I'm, I'm, I'm loud and mad and hurt. So the, that, that there proves that our idea of falling in love is a lie. And um, we're moving to a dimension where we're going to have to cut out that I'm seen through other people. In fact... The more you want to feel seen by someone now, the more they're falling off and the more you're finally able to see yourself. And ironically, the more you see yourself and don't need to be seen, the more people start to see you, right? So the, the universe, I feel, matches how much you see yourself. And if you're constantly going... I'm only seen when that person sees me. And by the way, usually we pick people that don't have the capability of seeing us. Like we want the most egoic stuck person to see us too, right? So now we're in a place where we don't see ourselves and we're mad at them for not seeing us. And then instead we can let that, they don't have to see me energy fall away, or I'm going to say my truth no matter what and let them fall away or whatever it is. And then on the other side, what happens is you finally see this poor inner child that was going, dad, see me through this guy or mom, see me through this girl. And now that child is seen directly and then it'll be alchemized that the desire to be seen will actually slowly dissipate into tears and leave. So, cause you are seen completely, but we don't want to try to be seen by other people's egos. We want to be seen by the self and the world will mirror that action. It'll give you amazing people seeing you and higher frequencies and divinely protect you from people that would never understand you or are wanting to attack you or anything else, right? You're just free in that energy. Yeah. One of the, the first things that I really got and learned out of working with you back in 2020 was this whole, like, um, you know, need to be special, need to be seen as special. And that it really, um, you know, you, I had talked to you about it back then, but it inspired me to write um, kind of a play off of your amazing book that I recommend to everyone, The Illusion of Money, kind of the illusion of specialness, because Mm. um, I wrote like a one woman show about it, because really the comedy in it is that um, you're special by definition as compared to other people. And so, you know, and then and then there's this like arbiter of your specialness that's outside of you. It's like just a random person. I mean, if you 
if you actually looked at who you're giving this power to, in your mind, you give it to the right person. But if you just imagine that you're giving it to the barista at start, and we do, right? We do that. We, we give it to the people in social media. We give it to the people on YouTube. We give it to anybody. But like, what happens when that person, let's say, dies or goes into a coma? Now there's no way for you to be, you know, deemed special. It's just this like crazy concept once you actually think about it that you can take your power back of, I deem myself special and I see myself. And that was really the first piece that I learned from you, that I was giving that power away, trying to find a relationship. And, oh, go ahead. And, well, I would add to it, on top of I see myself as special, adding the frequency of, this is a very Kyle sentence that would have formed in the last three years, but you're allowed to not feel special in my body. I mean, is there anything more loving than telling us an energy that doesn't feel special that it's allowed to feel that way yeah. versus covering it up and going, well, let's get special. Like, like imagine just you're here with this energy and saying you're allowed to be not special in my body. Like, I love you even if you're not special. Yeah. Now we're really hitting something. Like, yeah. I think that's so much deeper than going, I don't feel special, so I'm going to fight to be special. Like, in other words, if you're, if you're scared of being broke, so you're fighting to get rich in that moment out of your fear of being broke, it doesn't have nearly the same power as if you have the energy of you're allowed to be broke in my body. And then you'll, we won't believe the level of creativity and, and magic that you can have if you're not doing this out of terror or fear of feeling a certain way. Yeah. So if the energy is allowed to feel special uh, or, or not special um, or whatever it feels, now you're directly hearing it. And then it, because it also believes in unconsciously not feeling special equals death. It's not even about special. It's like going, when I wasn't special among my siblings or something like that, like I don't, I, I get abandoned and that hit trauma in my little child body. So like I, I, I get special, otherwise you won't get fed or you'll get hit or yelled at or shamed or abandoned or something like that. So then you start to break it down. And you realize this isn't even about special. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This well, is, yeah. what I love about this and then just all of it is that it dissolves the power of the idea that you need to get special. And that was something that you really taught me in stand-up comedy, but like in, I apply it to everything is like, is that feeling or fear, are you making that bigger than yourself? So when you make the need to be special bigger than yourself, it, it's like consuming. You're in that addictive pattern of trying to get there. Yes. Um, so when you let yourself feel it, it integrates into you and it takes away the power. Now you are bigger than it, right? And who, and who is it that is trying to get special? Like, who is that? Like when we go meet, how do you define you? Like, because there, it's a, it's a child that's in your body taking action when you're a grown up. Right. Like here we are in our forties with an, with a, with a five-year-old going get special. Yeah. Right. It's not you. You're the one sitting here. You, you and I are the ones sitting here. Like everything's fine, right? But I could let the kid take over and be like, I'm unseen. I'm attacked. I'm being, I'm, I'm not loved. I'm not special. And it's all arbitrary because really I'm just sitting on a chair. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? I totally get it. And it's funny because I'm thinking, yeah. And who's the one that's showing up on the date? Who's the one that's, you know, writing the dating profile? Like you, in each scenario of a relationship, this dating process, there's a five-year-old and there's a 40-ish, 40 plus year old that are somewhere right. in the forties. There's, there's a young lady um, that's showing up for this date. And it's like, you know, like, or when you don't, and I want to talk about ghosting um, for a second, but like when you get ghosted, who's getting ghosted? The four-year-old, the five-year-old? or the 40-ish year old, because, um, because you're going to react accordingly, right? right? And that's our whole, like... And who's around. doing the ghosting, right? right? right. The five-year-old, we're all just transcending our children that are all a bunch of fears that I find that when you investigate deeper, they dissipate. It, it's literally a lack of truth and investigation that causes these patterns to stay here, Yeah, you know, that 
we it's like imagine the difference of like even being like that guy ghosted me okay so that that grown man in his power uh the word ghost has so much more to it than just chose to not call me yeah (laughs) yeah right like because they people refer to ghosts as spirits so i was thinking the other day i'm like Ghosting is not a spiritual activity. It's, you know, like, it's not really showing up in your power. But I love how, how yes, by labeling it that, it makes it, like, a huge, um, a right. huge thing. I mean, why not call it stabbing or <laughs> massacre, you know, like... Heart massacre. Right. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. I was, I, I was just thinking how, if we can step back and have perspective at any point along this you know, timeline, um, it gives us so much freedom and so much peace. And there's a lot of compassion that we can have for ourselves and for other people where it's just kind of like, I bless you and, and let you go. And yeah, I was telling you how um, at your recent event that I went to in Sedona that uh, I had worked through one of my stories, pretty much not, you know, yeah. it's always evolving, but like um, to the, the need to be seen, like when I started seeing myself, I really, I really got to the place where I thought, okay, I feel fulfilled in this. My, my five-year-old is seen and like, I'm good now. I, I could see my, the, the choices I was making and the emotions that were coming up just shift as a result of that. But when I went to your event, I learned that coupled with that one, and you had said that, you know, there's, there's like a two pack of these stories. They often come together, mm-hmm. um, was the need to be remembered, um, in wow. the sense like, see me, but don't stop seeing me. Like, I don't need you to see me, but cause you're going to see me. I see me, mm-hmm. but don't stop. See- like, I want to be significant. And I thought, how crazy is that in the context of a, um, relationship? Because one of my like triggers is I want consistent communication. So essentially it's don't stop seeing me, keep remembering me constantly, you know, communicating with me. Right. Um, and, and let me ask you this, cause I, one of the things I point out at the event is whenever there's a specific request of the ego, it's very big to try to get specifics to know when you're there. So, so I've used this a lot as an example, but if someone says, I'm worried that I won't be enough, I like to ask their ego, when do you measure that you are enough? Right. When, when do we know we hit it? A hundred thousand dollars a year. Dad says, good job. Like what you're married. How do you know that you, what's the line? Cause deal ego will try to get to enough. What's yeah. the line. And you'll realize the ego ha- hates specifics and wants to stay vague. The ego needs vagueness because it's not the truth. Right. So, so if I say to the ego, so when are you enough, then it doesn't have an answer. And for you, how long do you need to be remembered for it to suffice? Like, what's the, I need to be remembered, what, forever? forever. Like, I, long after I die? I, I want the ex to remember me six years? Like, what's the, what's well, it's the so line? weird, too, because it's like the people that would remember me don't count, right? Like, not that, I don't need those people to <laughs> That's keep That's so it. true. Once I'm memorable to someone, I don't need them to remember me. I need it to be people that I'm not memorable to. They need to remember me until yes. they can't forget me and then they don't matter. What you're saying is so, so, so big because, because I've had it many times where I want to be seen by truly this avatar that still exists in my body, but less and less and less, truly the heaviest frequency angriest, most shamiest person I can come up with. And I don't even notice and the ego doesn't notice how seen I am from 99% of the rest of the people. And it just goes, no, that one fully angry, stuck, blind person that feels like a family member or is a family member. Yeah. Right. It's when that person remembers me that I'm free. And that that's not true because even when they do, you'll sit there and go, they might lose it. So it's, it's, it's much more about seeing that pattern that believes in that until it's released fully. And then it actually releases that lowest common denominator person from remembering you. Like, in other words, the same, 
I found in me that, that the shame in my body that I've had, that if I'm like picturing people that'll shame me if I open up about something, I notice that when I do and cry it out, the, those avatars of those people leave my life too. Like I suddenly feel free of it, right? So we got to take in this old energy of the lowest common denominator that really probably feels more like a parent that we go, when that person remembers me, then I'm free. And we don't notice all the people that do remember you because then the, the ego would have no job anymore. And also, what is remembering anyway? There's no time, right? There's no such thing, right? And I find the more we want something, the more we're actually preventing ourselves from having it. I know someone that really has a lot of I don't want to miss time with my child. I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss out. Yeah. And I find that the more they talk like that, uh, the more they're missing a lot of things, right? They're missing moments to moment, right? And they're, and they're trying to egoically construct remembering versus just be in the now. And, and imagine if you just release the need to remember because there is no time and everything in the world will be forgotten at one point. That's a very humbling revelation. But at one point, I won't even be a memory. At one point, my mom won't be a memory. At one point, my daughter won't be a memory, right? Like that we're all just passing things. And my friend Glenn Morshower says, it's because this moment's temporary that it's so beautiful. And you can really, if you accept if you truly accept the temporary as true, which it is, uh, you're going to have so much more joy and you'll have less of a need to remember and remember more things while experiencing the now much more too. Yeah. I love, you talked about that at the retreat. Um, and I wrote it down as the Vegas effect, right? Like if you lived in Vegas, no offense to the people living in Vegas, you're not living on the strip, but if you are, you're probably not listening to my podcast. Anyway, I don't want to offend anyone. Um, sure. You don't want to be in the casinos in Vegas for like ever. Year. In it's, fact, yeah. you see people that are, Yeah, there are people I, I know immediately without it being judgment, just right. imagine. So I'll even let the, the viewer just create the own image yeah. of the people who live in casinos. Yes. Right. How, what do you picture? Definitely not in touch with all the internal stories and the inner. Ch I mean, it mostly, you know, there's alcohol, there's gambling. It's like you're in an addiction, you know, bubble. Right. Essentially. Right. So, and, and the reason that came up is like, there's these things that we think that we want to experience, but you can't just experience on the high the whole time. Everything that you want to experience, it's actually, it's temporariness that makes it so exciting. If you know you're going to Disneyland for the day, you're going to enjoy it much more than if you knew you were moving there. If you were moving to Disneyland and just lived in Tomorrowland and knew that, that you're, you're in that area, it's the knowing that you're leaving it that makes it better right? It's the knowing that when you go to Vegas, you're going to leave it. In fact, the longer people go to a trip to Vegas, when they leave it, the more they're like, why did we do that? God damn it. You know, I'm out of money. Like I yeah. get your story straight, <laughs> you know, like there's so many things. And so we were talking about this at the event too. Like imagine a massage, someone gets a massage from yeah. a masseuse, but they don't stop. Imagine them getting to hour five and six and like, they just keep going, you know, and it just starts to hurt and you're like, I want to go do other things. Right. So this is, this is our problem is falling in love is a temporary experience that, you know, we're trying to keep forever and we don't understand that it's the temporary that makes it, makes it much more amazing. Right. That yeah. I get to feel in love right now and I understand tomorrow it might feel different and that's fine. Right. And you will enjoy life so much more understanding that it's temporary choosing to accept the temporary right yeah and that this becomes an experience imagine if you knew you were going to a movie that never ended yeah. right no i loved that and i i mean I, I talk about throughout the podcast in the context of dating but every principle we talk about is for whatever it is that you're you know focused on and so you know i've told you before that i have this i want to hear from the person again and it's funny because i didn't really think of it as a desire to be remembered. Because if you would have said you, you know, I'd be like, no, I don't have that story in me. It wasn't until I was at your event in a seat like that I, it really came up for me. And so two things, one is I'd love to talk about like, how do we, 
you know, what are the practical steps for seeing yourself and like identifying the stories, yeah. getting them out? Um, well, let's start with that. Well, let's do this. This is a thing that came up at the event. It kind of wrote itself and it was amazing. And here's an actual like step-by-step -step thing to show you something really big. I, it's something I called and created there, circumstance feeling now, okay? These are the three steps, right? So on one egoic level, you think your problem is your circumstance. Like for instance, that guy didn't call you, okay? Yeah. Now, if you keep your focus on the circumstance, uh, you will stay victim. You will stay in blame. You will not see the truth of what's going on. And you will uh, continually be at a war with yourself and not have any resolution except for the potential of a mediocre external resolution like him calling you. But we didn't get to the root of the problem, right? right. So the first one is circumstance. The second one is if instead of us being on the circumstance, we notice what we feel about it. Right. So instead of he didn't call me, I feel unseen. I feel unspecial. I feel abandoned. I feel unloved. Right. Now, where's our focus? It's not on the dude. It's on you. Right. So now you're present with an inner child and you're going, I see that you feel abandoned. The more you do that, the longer you sit in that the more it will stop being about the guy at all. And you'll start to notice patterns of in the childhood where the kid felt abandoned, that this guy now is just triggering and trying to get you to look at, right? So the first one is the circumstance. The second one is the feeling. I feel abandoned. I feel unloved. We undo, the circumstance can be there for the trigger, but then we release it and we just go, okay, I feel unloved. I feel unseen. I feel unwanted. I feel abandoned. Then the third one is to be with the now. The now wants to see deeper. The now naturally wants to just alchemize and, and go deeper with it. So for instance, that actually happened to me this morning. Uh, someone wrote a comment on a video that was completely inaccurate and I have a trigger of being accused of things that aren't true, right? Yeah. Just like that's a huge trigger of mine because I wanna go in and explain myself. And then I notice that often when I do, they don't care, yes. right? The person that did is like, oh yeah, no, they wanna keep the shame on you and blame or whatever. And that I'm always fighting a winning war or losing war when I go explain myself to anyone that wants really to have this kind of feeling of control over me or just shame or whatever. So I almost responded to something that someone had said that was completely inaccurate. And instead I just decided, okay, I'm gonna go on a long walk in the woods without my phone even with me. Like I won't even have it with me to make videos in the woods or whatever, I just will go on a long walk. And I just started hearing the energy in the body of the kid that feels unsafe, that feels uh, abused, that feels whatever, and saw that he feels he has to carry more than he does and just kind of let the now be with him. And when I got to the other side of the hike, I decided not to respond and, and really said, my intention is to be with God and not keep an image going or fix something and I'll sacrifice everything to find the highest level of my connection with myself. So I actually did the three, right? Circumstance. This person is saying something that's not true. You know, I, I would be stuck in a very shallow level of anger and blame and triggers if I stay on that level. Second, I go to my feeling. I feel unseen. I feel misrepresented. I feel unprotected. I feel unloved. I feel, uh, you know, all these things. And then, and then third is like to spend an hour and a half with no phone in that energy, L really letting the, the hills and the trees take over and, and really get connected to what's more true, right? So that anyone can do that. If you're triggered by anything, that person did this, or I feel so mad about this thing with my bills or my taxes or, or, you know, go to when you're triggered, don't fight it at the level of the thing, go to what you feel and then go deeper. What's the now What's the, what connect with the now, which is actually more true than your passing story. That's keeping your small story alive and get here. Right. And the now is trying really hard to get you deeper than this kind of ocean of your soul that you've been water skiing over 
that you've been staying on top of. It's like going, oh, I got depth in here and I got magic. And when you listen, we're going to eventually alchemize the child that feels unseen. And the world mirrors that. It does. You start to see the world different once that thing's gone. So that's our job right now, you know? And and so for you, Rachel, if you go, okay, he doesn't call, one, two, I feel, what would you say you feel in that? Um, I feel sadness comes up and I feel not good enough. Okay. So perfect. So I want you to just let those be there and we undo the fixing of the level of the guy, right? Yeah. Like that's not the, it's even if he calls you now, that's not the answer to this, right? Because that's still there, right? right? So if he called you this minute, it could make you temporarily re-excited and not see this energy that's right here. So the universe is so cool because it often makes people not call you. So you have to be with this, right? Mm -hmm. So sad was one. Yeah. Sad. Um, Hopeless. Hopeless is a big one. Hopeless. Beautiful. Which implies we need hope, right? Yeah. So would you say you're allowed to feel sad in my body? You're allowed to feel sad in my body. Really receive it. You know, mm-hmm. you're allowed to be hopeless in my body. You're allowed to be hopeless in my body. Which by the way, it's just as a side note means that the character that's fighting to be seen requires thrives on hope more than the now. Yeah. Right. Hope is future. Yeah. Right. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I absolutely do. Like, like, do we want to live in a fantasy like of hope all the time? Think about that for a second. Let's, let's constantly be in the future of some fantasy and have no reality with the now, right? That's, that's hopeless, right? Yeah. So hopeless would be really good for you. So truly you're allowed to feel hopeless in my body, right? Energy will yeah. be surrendered in that. The third one is, what was it? Uh, Not good enough. Not good enough. You're allowed to be not, okay. And again, I'll ask the ego, where do you measure good enough? What's the line? Does it have any answer there? Well, it, it, it's, it has a, it has a wrong answer essentially. Cause it's like, well, by what you're upset about, it would be when you're in a relationship, but that's not real. Like that's not, that right. doesn't make you good enough. We know, we consciously know that. I mean, we could, we could test that theory. So what we're saying is the second I'm in a relationship and throughout the committed relationship, I always feel good enough. Yeah. Is that a a true statement? No, no. I love, can you just share? Cause I love when you talk about the whole lottery ticket, um, concept, like you have a winning lottery ticket. You don't have the money yet. It's kind of the same thing. Like you, you're in a relationship, but then you get broken up. The, the feeling in your body of being good enough, or if you're worried about money, imagine how you'd feel when you, when you can see on the TV that your lottery ticket matches the winning numbers. All of a sudden, you feel abundant, but you don't even have the money yet. So what if all of a sudden they reported that, you know, the numbers were wrong and you didn't win? I, and, I love that. Um, is, it, is it the, because it's, I'm slightly remembering and slightly forgetting. Is it the principle that your excitement about it is arbitrary anyway? Yes. Because you don't have the money in the bank. So they're just saying a thing and your mind is now believing something. So you're celebrating and happy and in the most joy ever based on some pattern of spoken energy that isn't based on that the money's there. That isn't based on anything. It's based on the illusion of hope in the future, right? But it's very arbitrary why you're happy in that moment because you do not have the money in the bank yet, right? If, if they came out and said, so like a person could say to you, I'm in love with you. And you're like, oh my God. They're like, actually, I'm not. Oh, no. And exactly. like this kind of high and low <laughs> is so bizarre because it's just sentences. Arbitrary. It's not like, right. And so we and start to realize- all of our happiness has nothing to do with that, right? Like it has nothing to do with if you actually have the money in the bank. It has nothing to do with uh, if someone says, I love you back. It has nothing to do with if that guy calls you. It's all bullshit. It's just like belief systems getting what they want. To, it's belief systems hearing what they want to hear to not have to face darker stuff that they're holding on to under it. That's all that is. Say more about that because that's well, the key. Yeah. 
well, there's something under it, right? The belief of not complete the second you hear you won the lottery, now all your problems are answered for a second, right? So you get excited, but you're not really looking at the deeper reason why you're feeling happy, which is that a fantasy in your mind is now covering up feelings of lack, limitation, like under it, your soul feels like it's not enough. And some people might tie it to money, but still it has nothing to do with money, right? I can never figure out money. I'm always a failure with money. And you're really saying I'm always a failure and you're using money or whatever. So when you get, oh, I won the lottery or I fell in love, now I have this mental projection to not experience the feeling of not enough that still exists in my body. This just falsely band-aids the belief of not enough for a while. And I promise you, I actually know a lottery winner who won the lottery and said then it was it was the worst experience for her family. Everyone wanted money. They all, you know, they all got sloppy with money. They, they got, they went broke faster because they just thought they had this crazy level of abundance, but the true patterns of what was under there still remained. They were just now covered up. And we got to ask ourselves, what would I rather? Would I rather have deep rooted negative patterns that I'm covering up with external icing of joy of false circumstances? Or would I rather have life take the distracting circumstances away to get to the root of what is in my body? that is not seen. And it, that's what life is doing right now for us. We just don't understand that. A lot of people's lives are falling apart right now to get to the root issue. And what's happening is the universe is going, I'm going to get to the root issue of what's in your body now. And you cannot cover it up with the belief that you have that job. You cannot cover it up with that image. You cannot cover it up with, with the relationship. That's why relationships are collapsing. You know, in 2020, you couldn't even cover it up with a restaurant or you couldn't cover it up with travel. You couldn't just run from your problems. And now the universe is making us go inward and people are talking different now. Instead of saying like, I'm, I got that job or that relationship, they're saying more and more stuff like, you know what's coming up for me? You know what I'm feeling right now? I'm, I'm discovering this thing. I wonder if I'm transcending. You know, I mean, like we are starting to more and more except for the people that are completely not interested in shifting who are using addictions to shove everything down more and are going down rapidly now because the consciousness is too high for them to you have to either open up and heal or you're going to become addicted faster right yeah so so w the universe is trying really hard to get us to lose the old way of being where your measurement of your success is based on your circumstances it's going to be more and more your measurement of success is your ability to see the true you and alchemize the false you by watching it and loving it and being there for it right yeah i love that so much and i'm you know i'm i'm as you're talking i'm thinking of although these are not the people that would be listening to my podcast but the people that i've heard you kind of address that are like yeah but i still want a relationship or i still need to make money or whatever and there's this is in no way precludes that in fact yeah in I fact it, yeah. It, you know in fact it makes it you know as at like dating right the person and you've said this to me before the person that's less you know, look at me, see me, I'm a five-year-old, I have all these triggers, is going to be more attractive and attractive to the right situation by being that healed version of themselves. Same thing with whether you want a job or start a business or whatever it is, doing this process and being in this consciousness is um, not right. only good for yourself and what you're looking for, but also I've heard you say like collectively it's, um, you know, benefiting the world basically if you think about it like as you and i are working on doing everything we can to go up some kind of vibrational ladder if you ask either of us like what we would like in a friend between this this type of two people one person who looks like they have all their shit together and they they can create an image that they're they're doing great and they're whatever or a person that completely can own that things are falling apart in their life and they're still okay with it but there there's a humility there's an openness there's a vulnerability there's an interest in like change there's growth there's there's owning that they've made mistakes there's all these different energies that like can make a person truly evolve I find the first one to be more of an image and and not an unfolding and not real change, except for that will collapse at one point. 
and this person will be this constant ongoing change and much more of a represent, re representation of the infinite change of the universe. The reason I point this out is some people might actually gravitate towards the image because they're also being the image too, right? And they, they might kind of get clumped at stuck at their old story or their past accomplishments or their past victim story or something. And these people are going to be an ongoing evolution, right? So the reason I say that is because as you, in, in response to something you said right before this, you and I might find vulnerability really attractive and that, that would be the match to us being that, but that might be a real threat to the people that are on the image world, right? Yeah. So as, as you unfold, you'll start to see the match that supports that and you'll actually see the world differently and you'll see people that match that and you'll see, strengthen you in your authenticity or in your truth more than in your bearing of it to look good to others and the others will clump to each other too and i'm trying to remember what brought that up but you were kind of asking about something that had a like a tra tracks like vibration question to it well i love where you went with it because i've talked about this in my podcast before growing up and living and dating in newport beach which is orange county which is like very known to be superficial um, the choices of candidates out here, you know, for a while I took it as either rejection or an insult or I was, wasn't good enough. And, and through doing this, um, I do feel like I have that kind of perspective. Like you talked about when you're going to pick a friend, I have so many friends that are in personal development and coaching now because we speak the same language and we don't sit in the victim consciousness of our circumstances mm -hmm. and a lot of the people that I know um, or meet and see around here, not everyone, I have many great friends from here, but, um, or people that I'm on, are, are on the dating apps mm -hmm. are in that different consciousness. And so instead of looking at it as I've been rejected or I haven't been chosen, right? I'm not chosen. That's another story. It's really, um, this is not a match. It's just not a vibrational match because they're in the, kind of image looking for that kind of stuff. And I'm more in vulnerability, you know, sharing who I am, seeing myself, not needing to be seen, not being in the addiction, all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and it makes, I mean, we, we don't want to not have triggers, but it makes some of the things less triggery because it's kind of like, oh yeah, I, we're not a match. We're just not a match. It's, it's, there's a level of acceptance of what is, Yes. Is present when you can see that kind of dichotomy. Well, and you know, one thing that is, I think is really, really important to mention is that as you're going up the spiritual ladder, you're going to start to see relationships move differently than the old way. Like, in other words, we're really in a, it's an interesting thing because there's a paradox to what you're doing right now, like consciousness and relationships, right? Like, in other words, relationships usually have an energy of you're an answer to my life. You complete me. We do this together. I can't without you. And that paradigm is a third density paradigm, right? That's a, that's a world of codependency, right? And ironically, when you're shifting into a true higher conscious world, relationships can exist naturally as a byproduct, but less from like contracts, less from we have a deal, less from it's out of love, you know, like Maya Angelou, I think is one of our greatest. And she says, love liberates. This is so important. Love liberates. Now imagine two people that are like, I love you so much, no matter what you do, you are free to be, you are free to have your own guidance system and make your own choices. Now there's going to be some issues there in the in the third density world right this person doesn't have to check in with this person all the time they don't have to you know feel in trouble if they hang out with someone that's the opposite sex right like there's all these different controlling aspects that have to be released but what happens on the paradigm of a, of a of a fifth dimensional relationship in if two people are just offering love and zero control they each become naturally the highest choice for the other person but it's not based on we promised six years ago we weren't going to it's right. based on 
evolution. And the soul's evolution is first, and the byproduct is the relationship follows that both people are evolving themselves, right? But if it's like, okay, I love you so much, here's all the things you can't do. Now you have a, an old paradigm relationship hitting a, a, a new paradigm person, and that's going to collapse instantly. So as you're moving forward, Rachel, like, we, one of the gifts that, that this podcast and your work is doing is, is helping you heal these wounds mm -hmm. because, and, and a good relationship could help you heal those wounds, but it's because both of you are in the truth of your evolution, even if it requires the sacrificing of the relationship. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Cause if the relationship starts to be bigger than the evolution, it'll be pulled apart. Your, your consciousness is too high. Yeah. So so if you want a conscious relationship, it's about your soul's unfolding and then the, the, the complete fineness with being alone if you don't have someone and that you're, you're, you're with God. And then maybe someone later that's doing that same work will just naturally hang out with you because you and them and that person evolve. That is so important to get the difference between that and trying to enter uh, a, a, you know, higher density frequency while still being in the paradigm of a control based relationship. It won't work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, it's funny because I used to joke, like I can't even get in a bad relationship. That's what would make me so sad because I'd look around. I'm like, look at all these people. And then this morning, finally this morning, I was like, I won't let myself get in a bad relationship. Like I, that's why I'm not, because the more work I do, the smaller the pool, potentially, you know, it's an illusion, yes. but like gets of the people that are also doing this work. And so, yeah, there's plenty of people, there's plenty of fish in the sea, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to want to be in a relationship with someone that isn't doing this work also. Well, here's a huge question to ask. This is a question I've asked myself more for people that might want to date me in the past. What would you rather have? A relationship or time with me? I want you to see the difference because one is time with me, right? The other one is you can feel, I can feel when someone just wants a relationship. Yeah. Do you know how weird that is for me? It's like, you don't even want me. Yeah. You just want a relationship. You want that title, yes. right? And it could be with a lot of people because someone else will commit to you in a way that's within your control. But I've had times in my past where I had relationships with people and I felt they didn't really spend time with me. Like we weren't, you know, we yeah. weren't really in a relationship. We were in a title. Yes. And so there was some element of security for them, but there was nothing that very little that felt like expansive or connected or soul for me, it was just like, okay, we're in that title and now they have license to be mad at me a lot. You know, that's kind of what, <laughs> what it felt like to me. And I, I am so about like, okay, like ask yourself, what would you rather have time with a person, which is much more on a higher density frequency of like the understanding that it's temporary, that, you know, the, the relationship title has a false belief of forever. They lived happily ever after all these things. Right. Yeah. So really get clear on what you want and notice the, the freedom of like, I'd like to just spend some time with that person, or I'd like to go out to dinner with that person. I want to watch a movie with that person that, that has so much more depth to it than I want that title because that title feels like ownership the way we've created it. Yes, absolutely. What was that quote from your friend, Glenn? I wrote it down, but um, like at your retreat, the, something about the, what is it? It's because this moment is temporary that it's so beautiful, something like yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, that, that really um, was one of my, I had many big takeaways, but that was one of my big takeaways was, what if I just look at the temporariness of, the moment and the connection with a guy that I'm out with. And instead of wanting to like get my hooks in this one and like claim them or whatever, or worry about what's going to happen in the future, have the hope that something's going to not be hopeless, have hope. What if I'm just like really fully present in this, in this moment? And that, um, you know, I was telling you about the guy that I met in Sedona that I like actually got to play with that and like practice. Okay. What if this is just about like this moment? 
Like, can mm-hmm. that be enough? Yes. And actually that makes it even more special. Um, and I yes. just feel like it's such a gift. The specialness is in the moment, not the ego going, I matter more to this person than other people, right? right? Like that is, that's where the specialness is, the holy shit of the now. If you've ever had a near death experience or a real breakthrough moment or an ayahuasca journey that took you to the real now, you trust me, you see the specialness in everything. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. You're shifting the specialness about yourself to the moment, like every moment's special because every moment's the now, but it's special in a different way. And you really just get to be present in that and then you're not collecting things that you're you know it's kind of like the beach like you can't take the shells you can't like enjoy the shells when you're at the beach don't take them home because that's like some little crab's house so leave it there but just enjoy it post many pictures of it on instagram but then leave it and go have a new moment like now you're you know at a restaurant or something um and i just imagine myself like trying to collect things and people and taking them with me and you're kind of destroying the specialness of the now when you do that. Completely. Yeah. I want to own it. The ego wants to own, right? Yeah. Like there's some things we can own by a house. It's better than renting, I think. But like at the same time, the yeah. ego goes, I want to own this moment. I love that person so much. I want to own them. I want to have the title of them. I want to, you know, make them mine and, and create a my energy. Right. And uh, that is really dangerous. Like that's where you're going to always be in pain because someone is yours and then eventually they won't be. And you're going to be so mad because you created an expectation. I mean, a, a big quote of mine is no one's ever broken your heart. They broke your expectations. And by breaking your expectations, they get you closer to your heart. And one thing I'm learning so much is, I, I'm learning how true this is. Like the content that I'm doing, that they were little things that I was stepping into five, six years ago. Is like these are these are true things, and now I'm just like this is how it works. Like it feels almost scary to be like attachment based relationships are not going to be sustainable anymore. And you can just picture all the angry married couples that hear that and be yeah. like, "Eden's like that's fine. I'm telling you." as we move up in light, like I, I'm just owning even more this consciousness. Like you can get married if you want, you can have that, but know that if they're the answer, life is going to pull them from you to get you to see you're still alive without them. Anything you think outside of you is the answer to your life. Life has to remove it from you so you can see you're still okay without it. So I believe even if you want to go really deep, that the world mirrors what's inside of me and yours mirrors what's inside of you. And we have deep rooted terror fears in our body, being not special, being falsely accused of something, all these different things, right? I believe more and more that the universe is saying to us, I need you to transcend this. You can do it internally. You can do it with God. You can do it through meditation. You can do it through nightmares, or I'm going to make it happen on the external right? Like that thing you're scared of, why does it keep happening? Why are we scared of being abandoned? And then they do it again. Why are we scared of going broke? And then it happens. Why is that? Because the universe is trying to get you to a place of surrender that when you finally experience your worst fear, you go, I really don't know what to do. And you start letting go and the energy inside that was triggered can finally dissolve. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree with that. I kept getting ghosted to, to use an old term that I don't use anymore. (laughs) Um, and I stopped and I was like, where am I ghosting myself? Like, let's just see where I'm ghosting myself. And I realized, because I was reading Atomic Habits, um, that I was not keeping my commitments to myself. Mm. And as I started making these commitments and keeping them, the, um, desire to hear from these men or whatever, it really lessened. I mean, it just put things back in perspective because and then I didn't really notice that happening as much, the the kind of ghosting and people not, not that they had a commitment to me, but that's how I interpreted it, that, that they had, like one guy I had a date with, and then he just didn't, he just never talked to me again. One guy I had a different date with, he just unmatched me instead of, instead of texting like, hey, let's not do brunch. He just unmatched me. So in my kind of rough kind of translation, it was, there was a, a kind of commitment he didn't keep. So I made it about me and, um, and it healed and I saw less of that on the outside. Well, and I can see a place where 
we ghost you ghosted yourself right the little girl is saying to you i feel not special and you go you run out of the room and find a guy yeah like if my daughter says to me i feel unloved and i go well let's fix that and i run and i get the neighbor to watch her tap dance yeah dad didn't stay with her dad left to go seek someone else to love her right so here's your inner child going i feel unseen or not special and you leave her for a guy yeah. with an ego, right? You leave her for a guy with all kinds of patterns in his body that you don't know about. And that his ghosting, which is only his decision based on his entire patterns, has everything to do with you and nothing to do with him. I'll tell you, as you go up and do more and more work, you get really scary to a lot of people. You're, you're, if you're in your truth, the people that do not want to face their stuff are going to be just leaving. Yeah. I had a woman one time that was working for me and she was going through stuff and I just started offering coaching to her. She was like helping me with something in my house and I just started offering coaching to her and she literally disappeared after that. Like I was just like, you know, like showing her a higher thing, like, you know, she had patterns of smoking and drinking and like wanting to bring to her the light that she's free of that if she wants to be. And I was offering support and everything, but that would mean she'd have to face her shit. And she left. Now, if you're on a dating site, you're only able to find people that go on dating sites. Yeah. Right. So they're already probably in some level of codependency. I mean, I'm not saying everyone is that's on that, but you know, you're looking for an answer externally already. So you're probably not fully connecting to God and letting the right person just be a byproduct of your connection to source. It's like find them on Tinder or something, you know, and yeah. right. Like then, then you just got that group of people that are in that same needy place that do not want to look at their shit overall. Some do, but most don't. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I would joke that the people that put spiritual on their profiles that would come and profess how spiritual they were, were the ones that would like ghost. And then I would just, I would just text and say, Hey, it was, Great spending time with you. I wish you the best of luck. Like, how hard would it be to say something like that? But then they they wouldn't even thumbs up back. So it was, and again, I didn't get offended. I just felt like I kept my side of the street clean. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like it's it's good nice. job. Thank you. It's nice to yeah. Do. And I didn't. I didn't. I never held it against them. I never. I I would feel my feelings, but I wouldn't go what a jerk and you know he should do this. It was just kind of like okay. Um, and so it, it was, it's, it feels like, and it was kind of my, my wrap up question for you would be like, I kind of looked at it as like transformational dating, right? Like how can I grow through this experience? And you talked about the circumstances, feelings now, which I really like. And I think you can apply that again to anything, but really use that to your advantage because one of the main things that I say as a rule of this dating process is like, how can I grow from this? Mm. And so, um, I don't know if you have any kind of thoughts. On like, that. how can you grow from that? Yeah. One of the things I would offer is take in the idea that you are growing naturally, right? One of the things I find for me that's happening more and more and more is there's less and less of a story of Kyle that can willpower his way to awakening, to growth, to whatever. In fact, it's more and more of a going away, a dissolving, right, of a false self. And so growth is a byproduct of surrender. I find that choosing surrender over control is really where you grow, right? Like, okay, this person ghosted me. There's a level where, you know, you can go, what the hell and go in there or just be in this frequency of you're allowed to feel ghosted and you're already going to remove yourself from the frequency of him and, and go up and move to a, a higher level of worthiness of love. And you probably wouldn't even attract someone that would ghost as much, or you wouldn't attract or you'd be even free of that and really enjoy the temporary with them and not see them not calling you as ghosting. Right. Right. right? Mm -hmm. I will say from my frequency, there's times where I'm like, I love the idea of having, this is just a, to give another perspective. I sure don't think you deserve to be ghosted ever, right. but right. I just want to show another possibility. I have, um, one of my, my all time, like lifelong best friend, 
this one friend that I've been friends with since junior high, we have this total ability to not respond to each other on a text and five months could go by and we talk like that didn't happen. And it's not like a blind to it. I just know that we love each other. He and I are dear friends forever. And like I could send him a text or ask him a question and he not respond. And there's nothing personal about it to me. Like I'm very used to that and the vice versa could happen. And then when we talk, it's like there was, it, it, there's no feeling of personal in that. We just know the other one's busy or in this frequency. And, and, it, and there's something so freeing about knowing there's something so freeing for me about knowing I don't have to respond. And this is my egoic pattern, but I don't re have to respond and I won't get in trouble, yeah. you know, like I won't. And that mine is getting in trouble, but like having people that I know that I can text back a week after or two weeks after and they're still just in joy makes me feel not controlled or that I owe or anything because there's times where I really don't feel like texting someone. Yeah. And like, if I'm like, I better, or they'll be mad or they'll feel ghosted or they'll feel abandoned. Then I know I'm doing it out of fear. And so I'm not saying the ultimate world is, is that for you, but I just want you to know how much there can be, a feeling of have to the other way. And then when you have someone writing you back because you're scared of being ghosted, now we're controlling them and they're in a way being controlled in their response. And the frequency is also weak in them responding. So they could, they could respond back and it'd be worse than if they ghosted you, at least they're being authentic with where they're at, yeah. you know, cause if you have someone just out of a fear of you being worried, they'll ghost you not they're responding out of that. That's also the beginning of not a good relationship, right? Right. So it might be a higher frequency to let them ghost you and find someone who naturally is desiring calling you versus one that just is responding out of your fear of not being ghosted, you know, and then they're out of their fear of you'll get in trouble or make their life hell if they don't respond to you. Well, it's <laughs> definitely having the awareness of it. Like while you were talking, I was like, it, it's kind of like, are you still there? is even, you know what I mean? Like, are you still there? Which is a old story for the five-year-old. And so once I, once I ask myself, do I care if this person is really still there? It's like, no, you know, so to have that kind of process and awareness, um, it takes, takes away the power of feeling, you know, left or abandoned or whatever is in there. So, um, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Either yes. The, the, yes. And are they allowed to not care? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, can we just like, like imagine the liberation for you and they're allowed to not care. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. And, and, and what level of light are you emitting on the other side of that? Right. Well, when you folk take your focus off of them and put it back on you and you stay with you, then it, you're there's, I'm not leaving me. Right. Right. And so it just, it, it transcends it. It's just, um, a really yeah. powerful exercise. So I love that. Yeah. And all we're, I really believe we're here to do is just alchemize these lies that we created as our survival mechanism in our childhood. And there are, this type of dating is a great way to do that. Wow. I feel ghosted. That reminds me of when dad left that day, or I, you know, feel shamed. That reminds me of when my mom did that, or I feel unseen. And, you know, I'm sure not saying start dating someone that does all those things, but like right. this process, even of finding a partner or being open to a partner is creating these insane opportunities for seeing deeper truths and healing them. Yeah, no, I love that. And then there's almost a motivation to not be with necessarily the same person for me in this process. Cause it's like, oh, what is this new person going to, br going to bring up for me? It's like a, you know, scavenger hunt of uh, wounding. Yeah, it's funny because even though I'm not saying like I'm a fan of polyamory or something, it is weird to be like you are the one person. It, there is something funny about that. Like it would be weird if you had a dream and dreamt about the one person every night always. Like meanwhile, life has created 8 billion people here. And so I'm not saying be with a million people, but I am saying like. Be with half a million people. Yeah, be with that. yeah. I am saying just open your heart to a frequency of that 
your expansion will always be bigger than a specific person being the one. And there might be one person that wants to expand with you in the same way and be an amazing choice. That's awesome. But stop making someone the one. Yeah. You know, and going, that's the answer to all my patterns and problems and pain. Because they eventually won't be. Yes. So my my um, search for the one is going to undo my need to have one. Right. And your search for oneness. Yes. Your search for real one. Yeah. You know? It's really... Uh, this is a really amazing time for us to leave the paradigm of the way that we've done everything out of control, out of protection, out of fear. You know, you have a child that's trying to not be abandoned by dad again, running you as a grown up. Yeah. And we need to get to a place where we understand our safety's in our body, not in a relationship. Like if that's another thing, you could enter a relationship one person could be trying to enter a relationship out of soulful expansion and the other one's out of protection. Like finally I have the security of a relationship. That's not going to work. Yeah. Right. Because you're not, if you're, if both people are willing to lose everything to find the truth of what they are, they might accidentally have a really good relationship. But if one is don't leave me while the other one's trying to expand, it's, it's going to be really difficult, you know? Yeah. And so permission to expand for both people or the decision for two people in more of the unconscious world that a relationship equals security is fine too. Yeah. Like if both of you are falsely saying this relationship equals security and you want to have that, that's great. Yeah. But, that's that's not that, but at one point your consciousness won't want that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, you're amazing. Thank you so much. I just love learning from you and you're just a blessing. I love you so much and I'm so grateful for you and I'm so proud you've done so much work. And it was such an honor to, when I was opening my heart to doing one-on-ones again, do daily with you. Yeah. I don't know if you've shared that, but you were a very rare client and that you wanted to work with me daily. And we worked every day like 40 days in a row or something yeah, like that? Something like that. It was like 35 and then we had a couple like straggler days. Yeah. And and that was so fun, but I mean like I just would wake up and see you daily and you know, we did a lot of great growth together in that. And yeah. and you're wonderful and you're such a good person and you have such a good heart and I'm so thankful to be on this journey next to you with the same boss. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>